Okay, so we're going to move right into our, our next uh, presentation, uh, which is uh, our, our brother, uh, Seba Wesley Cox. Uh, brother Wesley is a, uh, a, a practitioner of the game Umlaba Laba or Zulu Chess uh, and has become an exponent of it, uh, both online as well as in the St. Louis area and has shared the game from, from what I understand at this point with dozens of folks. Uh, and has ex uh, explicated the the benefits of the game, not just as a game that is something to be played for amusement or pleasure, but the implications that the game has for the African worldview. So the title of this presentation is The Necessity of African Games, the Comedic Origins and Principles of Um Laba Laba. So without further ado, uh, Brother Wesley Cox. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Baba Kamal. And would I also be able to share my screen? Yep, it's, it's already set. Perfect. Let me get this pulled up here then. Getting this shared. And can everybody see this? Yes, sir. Perfect. And then I have permission for my ancestors, to, excuse me, permission for my elders to speak. Yes, you do. Thank you very much. And so I actually want to start off by just saying I did decide that it might be necessary for me to change the title just a little bit. And so the title that I have prescribed this morning was The Necessity of African Games, The Comedic Principles and Maotic Nature of Um Laba Laba. And so this, as Babo Komao said, as we call him, as a student of his um, under Os Malandros de Mestre Toro, which is studying Capoeira, Angola, Sabenso Grange, and also um, as a student of the Temple of the New under Nasibiti Rasenku Kepper, something that I wanted to do today was really speak about, as Baba Kamau mentioned, Um Laba Laba, which translates literally as labyrinth, but is most commonly known as Zulu chess. These lines permeate the three concentric squares to create 24 intersecting points. And these are going to be the sites, each point, where Um Laba Laba tokens are placed. So in the game, there are two players, and they're each armed with 12 tokens. 12 are black. And 12 are white. Each player takes a turn placing their tokens on the board and then once the, whenever you get a line of three whether vertically horizontally or diagonally you are then allowed to take one of your opponent's pieces off the board and so that's going to be important because the game is not so much about individualism like say that of chess where every piece has a certain place and the game is structured for you. This game, you begin to create the environment that you move within and, 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 and take effect that way. And so the first player to capture 10 tokens wins. And so to kind of give you an example of that, I have pulled up the game here to show you what, what a game would look like, right? And so as you can see, the board is completely empty. And so Black goes first, and so I, you start by trying to figure out how you want to build, again, community. And so by going here and the opponent now going here, I'm not able to make three this way. And so I have to begin to figure out what's going to be another way that I can make three. So I place a piece here because I could either go there, and obviously it's been blocked, so I can go here. And by going here, it provides me that one of these I was going to be sufficient to have a line of three. So once I have a line of three, I'll be able to remove the token. And in this case, this is created by an app created by the Black Foundation. We'll be able to take one of the cattle, which of course is going to be very important to the Zulu people. And so just very quickly then, one of the ways that you can play Um Laba Laba is by going to app.zuluchess.com if you're on a computer. Otherwise, you would also be able to go to the app or the Google Play Store and we have created an app here. You can just search for Zulu Chess, and then it'll be a way for you to play the game just with your family, but also in distance with others. And so kind of getting back to the game, now that I have three, I get to remove one of my opponent's pieces. So I'm going to decide to take this one. And at that point, now they're replacing it. And so we're going to continue this alternating process. So they've decided to block there. So now I can go here. And again, I'm going to decide what I get to take. Now I can go there, but I'm going to choose not to because in the sense if we're looking at building community, by putting myself there, I have just created an individual. There's no way for that individual to connect with this community unless these pieces move. And so what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to move here. I let them take one and I can simply replace it. 
Now here what's interesting is that it took a piece in the line of three. It's always going to be easy to just remove, place a piece back and take your opponent's piece. Now they've relocated. I'm going to go here. They've gone there. I'll block there. Similarly, take this piece. And now I only have one piece left. And at this moment, this is where I'll now block. And so this would be the, the placement phase of the game. Now the second phase of the game is going to be the movement phase. And so what's important here is moving your pieces into lines, into open spaces, so that you can create a line of three. And so to that effect, end by moving here. Now I move here, and on my opponent's next turn, I can either go here and begin to take pieces, or I could go there and block because he wouldn't be able to make, or they wouldn't make, be able to make a line of three. You just begin to still play the game, um, but you, now you're working on destabilizing right, your enemy's connection with it themselves. So I'll take this piece. Then I can move this up. I make a line of three. Now I can take this piece. Now I can move this down. Take a line of three. I can take this piece, right? And now I could move this back. I can take this piece. And so you begin, you continue playing until your opponent has two pieces left. At the moment, my opponent has one, two, three, four. Once you have three, as if you were to have adrenaline, the opponent can then fly to any space they want on the board. And so as you begin to think about that, kind of almost lending the death blow. You want to make sure that they can't block you in a manner that stops you still from making three. So I'm going to go here, but I'm going to decide to take this piece because regardless of where my opponent blocks, I would still be able to make three. And now the game has concluded. And so to continue on here, you have two phases of the game, as you just saw. You had the placement phase or what I like to consider the birth phase, and then you have the movement phase. And so as it pertains to that birth phase, that placement phase that you guys saw, there's a few symmetries with the African life um, and the comedic understanding. One is that as it pertains to African cultural values, earth and nature, so the land, cannot be owned. And so whereas in chess, the game is structured for you, in um lava lava, you are, there's simply an environment for you and it is in that environment that you gain your powers as an individual, as a community, to affect change in the in the environment that you're living in. And so, Brother Wesley, say that again. Sorry. Five minutes. Absolutely. Thank you very much. And so then you also then have that movement phase, and so it's in that movement phase that you get to see one that pe places people since Africans are born anywhere. You are going to see that obviously we live in diaspora. And so it's not just our intimate local community that we're involved in, but we're, if you're born over here on the on square one or circle one, you're also intimately connected to the person in square five and 13. And so kind of to, to move forward a little bit to speak about some of the comedic principles and maotic nature of um laba laba, I like to talk about what I call the, the, quad, the quadripartite trinity. And so you have Sia, Hu, and Hekaf, right? You need clarity in your intuition you need authoritative utterances, which in that sense is going to be the confident and the truth of what you're speaking, and then hekau, which is going to be that ability to manifest or that creative capacity. And so again, you need to have a line of three in order to affect change in your environment. And so that line of three can be seen as sia, hu, and heka, or an understanding of the mind, body, and spirit. Because if you're not in harmonious relationship amongst different levels, as uh, Obenfo Badali spoke about, that you're not going to be able to truly live and practice Ma'at. That also consists of the Duat, the inner planes of the heavens to some, the cosmos and the earth. And so the physical nature of the universe that we're living in, as well as there's no such thing as death. And so what you saw, you see an open board where everybody are the, is, starts as those yet to be born. Once you're placed on the board, those tokens or those cattles then become living. And then once a token is removed from the board, then they become ancestors. And so in that sense, what you have is you have an understanding of the changes of nature and potentiality of a being, but not the end of a being in any way. And so you could also see those 
four lines that I spoke about as eight couples or as the eight principles or the four divine couples. So you're dealing with the solvency and water, the noon and the newt, the hu and hoot, the kiku and kut and the tim and timinu. You're dealing with infinity and time and space, right? Everything is open. You're dealing with darkness and light. And so black comes before white. And you also have motion and stillness. So even when a, a plate, even when a cattle or a token isn't moving, there are others moving. And so in tandem, it creates some type of energy for them. And so what do the eight principles of the four divine couples that create the board represent? It represents the establishment of the universe, which enables us to be divine beings, having a human experience with access to our divine powers. And so some of the symbolism that creates the maotic nature then of this game is that black always goes first. So you're seeing night preceding day. You're seeing that if we take a race first doctrine as African black people, as a bodily Kambon speaks so highly of, we, we should focus and be conscious that we are our central focus. And that black moving first also counteracts the Western histi historiography um, and the ill logic of it. It also speaks about the significance of the family. Um, Laba Laba is not a game of individuals working together for a cause, but of families and communities striving to protect and direct and perpetuate their existence within the realm of the game, which is going to be eternity. And so just as people at the University of Kemet Press speak about in their work, Ma'at, uh, they say that the African hydraulic system is that river-centric system, right, of production that created the communal property ownership and labor, as well as the seasonal public work projects organized around the cycles of the Nile. And so it's through correct collective work and responsibility within our, our family and the greater diaspora, which is going to allow for us to really transform and live with Ma'at. So what does that do? This establishes a Ma'atracy. And a Ma'atracy can be understood in the words of Hemet Netzer and Bada Ma'at as a form of government in which the ruling authority comes from adhering to the divine order of the universe. And so obviously that means just the rule of Ma'at. And so what does it mean to be in divine order with the universe? It means to be right, to be in harmonious balance with nature and the nature root. So with God and with the, the principles of nature that are beholden to uphold life as we know it. And so that means, as we said, dealing with Ma'at on multiple levels. You have the universal, you have the political, and you have the individual as we just heard. So that's also just dealing with the environment. It's dealing with our family and diaspora, our culture and our consciousness, and our economics and politics. And so I just have my references here, but at that moment, if I hope this kind of helps you just understand that, you know, with Umla Balaba, it's a game that can serve, you know, as a pivotal tool for us transforming African peoples through living Ma'at by it, by helping our children and our, our people, our, our brothers and sisters, just internalize different cultural but African concepts um, that can serve to benefit our psyche in the long run. So appreciate your time, Dua. Thank you, Brother Wesley. So, uh, any questions, feel free to add your questions to the Q&A, Brother Wesley. But I want, I want to add a, a question for you. When you were going through your presentation, <laughs> one of the questions that occurred to me, or one of the things, rather, that occurred to me um, was the, the implications of games. And it made me think about capoeira, obviously, right? Because capoeira, you know, if those that don't know capoeira is an Afro-Brazilian combat art or fighting art, it has... Uh, you know, these two sides to it, the, the, the fight or the luta and the jogu, the game. Uh, and it made me reflect very briefly about the implications of even that as a type of game and then the sort of myriad lessons implicit in the game itself. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the things that, I, that, that also struck me at that very moment as well was a thread that I saw on social media just a few hours ago where they were saying that um, uh, it was it's a, it's a very popular franchise of a uh, tactical uh, first person it's a first person perspective shooter tactical uh, there's a tactical mm -hmm. game and apparently the um, some of the executives in the company that publishes game have these connections to the defense department of the United States and they're basically arguing that the game is just propaganda it's just pro war pro U S State Department absolutely obviously propaganda 
And and so your presentation, I think, brought this idea home that games are not just about entertainment, but games are also inherently about the transmission and concretization of particular worldviews. And I was wondering if you could, uh, you know, speak to this the type of discernment that that perhaps we should bring to bear when we think about games, particularly when we assume that they're innocuous, that they're harm horrible. Absolutely, and so appreciate that. Um, those those sentiments and those words. What what I would say is that, like we said, kind of do a mimetic analysis of sorts when you're looking at what is a game, what might a game be teaching, right? There are a lot of times where adults can be sitting down. I can sit down with my niece, or I know I don't have children yet, but parents can sit down with their children and be watching a movie and be seeing something that the child is not going to be able to see just based off of a different philosophy, a different understanding about life. And that's important because what you might not, you might not understand how that is influencing your child consciously or unconsciously. Right. And so um, as far as seeing cop its connection with Capoeira and kind of seeing Capoeira as a game and a fight, um, I would say that, um, um la blah, blah can very much have a double face as well. And so if you're playing for fun with, you know, a friend, you might see, say it's, it's almost like a stable society, right? I'm not necessarily trying to compete and destroy you, but I'm just trying to have fun with you. And you could see that as uh, a time of peace, right? Where a nation is in prosperity. And so their main form of community might be something like the constructive tilling of the land, the building of community projects, and just developing their social cohesion. Whereas in less stable times, you might see this community develop more so about stressing the implications of how to fight an adversary. And so at that time, you can see one as agriculture and one as war. And so the utilization is very much based on what the community needs at that time. And so um, to that, I would also say that, you know, seeing it as something like in comparison to chess, when you're thinking about chess, as we said, the world is already set up. Every chess board start, every chess game starts the exact same. Every game of Um Laba Laba can be different, right? Because every iteration of life, every day of life, every moment is going to be new. And so it's teaching us something inherently about how to look at the world. Am I, do I have the ability to create a structure or do I only exist within one and I've already submitted my power to the ruling authority? Also, as you saw in chess, white always goes first, where in Um Laba Laba, black goes first. And so that's something else. What is inherently, I remember I, I went to, I was actually doing this presentation, well, not this presentation, but I was at a school and I was brought my Um Laba Laba boards at a harvest festival when we were playing and, you know, there were black and white tokens. And so I would start not by, because I was always going to let the kids go first. And so black should always go first because the loot, whoever is losing or whoever needs the, the benefit of going first is the one who would play first, right, to have the advantage. And so I'd always ask the students like, hey, um, what, what tokens do you want to be? Or what pieces do you want to be? And most of them would start off by saying, oh, I want to be the white pieces. And, they're like, and I was like, why? And they're like, because white's better, white goes first. And so what is chess teach? And a lot of these children play chess. And so what is chess inherently teaching our children that white goes first? And now they're seeing that as a structure of power. And so we need to have something to reverse that and to counteract that because that's, that's not, again, those are infective cultural logics for us as a people. So I've, that's kind of how I would say um la balaba, you know, speaks a little bit to both the just the effective dimension of games. Yeah, that's, that's an amazing uh, vignette, you know, with those children. Um, uh, two comments in the in the Q and A. Uh, Dr. Edward Poe writes brilliant presentation. Wesley also writes good point to the latter point. Uh, this means that black people uh, should uh, should be proactive rather than reactive. Um, one of the things I really appreciate. You know, that story, I, I taught Um Laba Laba in a, a school on the southwest side of Chicago. I was teaching Capoeira there, and the kids were just very, really active, so I was trying to sit them down and calm them down. So I taught them Um Laba Laba, and what I found is that that was the most quietest, the most reflective, uh, the most focused I had ever seen. They were like different children. And and I'm wondering also, in, in terms of what you've seen so far, what do you think is important about these games in terms of how they tap into our consciousness or rather how they facilitate our our development as people holistically? Certainly. So I would say, you know, you, you hear the phrase usually like the simplest thing to do is the hardest one, right? Living by truth should be simple, but if there's so many confusions and so many contradictions that it becomes it becomes hard for one to do or even see as some as a possibility in life. And so 
when when playing Umla Balaba, especially with a lot of these children, yeah, you saw that the ones that were the most hyper were the ones that were most willing to really sit down and because it, it, it makes you have to go into yourself. You have to it collapses space and time and recognition. You have to begin to play more with your heart than with your mind, which is a power that we need to learn to tap into. And so I would say what I noticed, especially playing with the younger children, is that something that they enjoy about the game that I think is important is that it is simple. It's as easy as tic-tac-toe to learn, right? You have you can move a piece, you can place a piece, and then you can move a piece, right? It's not like chess where you need to learn the type of movement that each play. And so it's very simple, but it's the simplicity that also allows for the mastery of it to be difficult. And so it, it's not, um, I would say it, it doesn't feel offensive just in its nature and i think that's because it's african and, and they they feel that once they they may not unconsciously know that but unconsciously they 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 certainly tap into that it's very interesting because i i taught it also to the youth at our uh, rights of passage program aquaban society some years ago and and same thing they they picked it up very quickly and and within minutes you know, had come up with all kinds of stratagems, you know what I'm saying, to take advantage of each other. And so the simplicity is sort of a door, a portal into a deep engagement. Uh, a couple of the comments, uh, this is from uh, oh, oh, uh, Brother Obadele, uh, Obadele, oh, Obadele Kamban writes uh, uh, that Mwalimu Baruti would have Black go first when he would teach chess uh, mm-hmm. at Uncle Ben Institute, which is, uh, which is excellent that he didn't adhere to that nonsensical Eurocentric rule. Uh, 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 Darnisha, I think it's Darnisha Pickett writes an awesome presentation. Uh, Dr. Edward Poe writes, you should mention your podcast and Umla Balaba Corner at blackfoundation.org for those who want to know more about the game. Do you want to speak to that? Certainly. And so as a member of the Black Foundation, you can go to BLAC for Black, B-L-A-C foundation.org. And one of the tabs will be Umla Balaba Game. And there you'll be able to see a lot of different articles um, written by myself and Dr. Edward Poe and others is on Umla Balaba. That's also where you'll be able on our website to find the game as well, besides app.zuluchess.com in the app store. And really, Black Foundation, as a part, as a member in the Umla Balaba coordinator, I've been really just trying to, to spread and share the game. And I saw a question that said, how do we come up with the concept for the game? And so this is a this is a game of Zulu origin. But we, as the Black Foundation, we are propagating the game and sharing it with others. And so that, that's usually an issue is that the knowledge and, and the activities and the information, the games, they're somewhere, but they're not in a place that's readily accessible to everyone. And so we are, we're working to, to spread this African game uh, and, this, and the, the Zulu culture in, in that form. And so, um, again, you can go to Black Foundation, B-L-A-C Foundation.org, and if you have any... An, there you also have like a contact form. You could also always reach me. My name is Wesley James Cox, W-E-S-L-E-Y-J-A-M-E-S-C-O-X at gmail.com. And you could always reach out there and be happy to kind of discuss more with you. And so the, the Black Foundation has chosen Um Laba Laba as a part of its Rising Star Initiative. And that's an initiative to, to holistically treat the mind, the body, and the spirit. And so we treat the body with capoeira. We treat the mind with Um Laba Laba. And then we treat our spirit with different African holistic or African uh, traditional systems. So appreciate that, Brother Wesley. There's another question in the Q&A if you want to follow up with that one uh, directly. And we're going to move to our next presentation so we can, well, we're, we're behind schedule. We can stay on our new schedule. <laughs> so thank you again, uh, Duao Sante Sana, uh, for, you, for your insight and for the, the work that you're doing propagating this wonderful game. Absolutely. So I do see... Um, two last questions. Were there any ma'at laws which exist within the game? And so I would say speaking to just balance and order and the, so you have truth, order, justice, righteousness, and harmonious balance. And so you're, you're really dealing with balance, right, in, in the game of um la ba, la ba How are you balancing the individuals that are on the board that actually connect into a community? And how are you working in, har- in harmony in order to affect change? Um, within the game. And then as far as the concept of memetics, I would say just look at the look at the work of Baba Wade Nobles, the Island of Memes. I think that's that would be an excellent location to start to understand memetics and just its effects um, on on African peoples.